yeah so uh thank you all for joining me thank you get guardian for having me uh, i'm excited to talk about wolfie which is a uh, open source project that we started over at chain guard uh, we'll get into that in a second a uh, quick bit about me you can find me on the internet at eddie zane i live in denver colorado where i like to climb big mountains uh, and I'm a maintainer for the Kubernetes and SigStore projects, so I can answer lots of questions about those things if you have any. Quick agenda for today, we're going to talk about software supply chain security, kind of define it, talk about some scary stuff, and then we'll talk about how we built containers today, and then we'll look at Wolfie and why we built Wolfie. And feel free to drop any questions in the chat as things are going. So software supply chain security, it's definitely the modern buzzword. You may have heard this in a bunch of different places. Uh, this is AKA spooky time where we kind of get to talk about why you've heard it so much. Uh, and if you were in the previous talk by Sonia, you would have seen quite a lot of these facts in very similar um, position on stuff. I like to start with this slide. This is the original kind of announcement that uh, Linus Torvald sent about the Linux kernel. Uh, he sent this to the Minx, Minix uh, mailing list. And I'll give you all a second to read it. But the important part I like to call out here is, is this first sentence where he said, I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU. And it's, this is from August 25th, 1991. And it's just kind of wild to think about that. Like this started as like a hobby project for him. And now it powers the modern economy in all companies, right? Like it's very difficult these days to not find Linux somewhere in your stack, whether it's a provider or you're running it yourself. So uh, open source is, is awesome and how powerful it is. And thankfully we know lots of use around Linux, but that's kind of the root of the problem with this software supply chain security that we talk about. So roughly 70, 90% of any software stack consists of open source software. It is basically impossible today to build any sort of application or any software that doesn't use open source in some form. Uh, whether it's your, your kernel, your compiler, your programming language, uh, it is just relatively impossible for you to do that without using open source. And that's just kind of where we are as a society and why we've been able to progress as an industry so far is thanks to open source. And this is a slide that kind of puts that in reality for us. Like your open source software is the underlying part of that iceberg that you don't see. And all the proprietary custom stuff you add on top is, you know, just a tip. Uh, it is it is a awesome industry, but the problem that I have as an open source maintainer is I have no idea who's using my software, right? I can build or you can build an open source library, put it up on GitHub for anyone to use, change or modify. Uh, and you don't know who's really consuming it unless they tell you, right? So you have no idea who to reach out to when you have a security issue or some sort of breach. The cost of a data breach in the US in 2022, according to IBM's research report, was $9.44 million. Uh, and that's kind of just the starting point. Uh, there's a whole lot that goes into different uh, countries and regulations based on what data was leaked and whose data. So it is it is a very expensive thing to deal with. You, you might hear this term software supply chain attacks quite a bit. Uh, this is really a term that you know became mainstream when it came to uh, the SolarWinds attack and the Colonial Pipeline attack. Uh, this is the idea that I, as a open source maintainer, uh, or a, uh, a even as a regular application developer, I'm not building every piece of software in my stack. So maybe a dependency of mine or a transitive dependency of mine gets compromised, and that slowly makes its way through the dependency web into my application, into my artifacts that I'm shipping to my customers. So it's like I said earlier, if you're a part of the panel, it's something that you know developers kind of thought in the back of their head, like, oh yeah, this could be bad one day. I'm just downloading code from the internet and executing it, but it's now bad and it's now that day. So we're trying to figure out how to secure it and make this a better uh, ecosystem for everyone. Bunch of other things have popped up. PyPI has had quite a few attacks, NPM. Uh, it's it's becoming super prominent. And it's honestly, it's a surprise that it took this long. Uh, back in the day when I was going to school, uh, we found that GitHub actually had a policy that you could request a GitHub user handle for a, a user that was no longer active. So a bunch of my friends from school uh, managed to get single character GitHub accounts uh, from like uh, I and X and K. Uh, and 
get up just kind of handed it over back in the day that was the policy if they determined that the account was inactive they would release the username and and that's like kind of crazy today like you you would never be able to just release a github username uh if anyone writes go like go import paths are based entirely on github usernames and paths to repositories so it's just it's kind of wild that you know all of this was possible but it didn't really start being exploited until you know recently uh, some quick numbers. We've seen a 742% average yearly increase in these types of attacks since 2019. Uh, when it comes to open source, uh, we're expecting 3.1 trillion total requests for, for downloads, consumption, and usage. And uh, when it comes to your dependencies and your open source stack, your transitive dependencies, so not your direct dependencies, but the dependencies of your dependencies and, and so down the web account for six out of seven vulnerabilities affecting open source projects. So, you know, you may be vetting the one project and the code that you're looking at, but uh, unless you're inspecting all of their dependencies and transversely from there, you, you are susceptible to this somehow. And so with all the spooky stuff out of the way, I like to talk about, you know, how we build containers and kind of how we arrived at you know, where we are today as shipping software through um, these container artifacts. You know, the idea of containers came from the, the shipping industry or, or the, the nomenclature, at least, where containers for, for cargo ships are standardized, right? You have to have a standard unit that people can transport their products across the ocean with. And so we have a standardized shipping container that, you know, what you put in there gets put onto a boat and it can fit X number of these and it's it's all standard and all the tooling and cranes and, and companies that make them all follow the same spec. Uh, and that was the idea behind containers, but where we're at today is how we build them or what we put inside those containers still has no standardization. And you wind up with kind of all sorts of different things. So if you've used Docker before, uh, this is a Docker file. If you're a Go developer, this probably looks 90% like your current Docker files. Just about every Go developer's Docker file is going to look like this. Uh, quick walkthrough. We have the, we're starting from that Golang base image. Uh, this is a multi-stage build. So I'm going to build in one step and then put my artifact in another to ship that. So I, I add my dependencies. I insert, I add my code. I, I run my build file, my build command. This is a command that I can't get rid of, right? When I think about building my code or, or building a Docker file, every, there's always like that one step that is the build my stuff command, whether that's like your npm uh, install dependencies or or pypi install requirements.txt, pip install requirement.txt. There's always this, this bit that you just, you can't get rid of or abstract away. This is the build my stuff command. Everything else in here and, and like copying over these SSL certs and we're not even copying the time zone database over from scratch is a, you can kind of start from like a, an empty image. This is, you know, if you're doing like a, a Go build or a Rust build, you can usually start from an empty image that it's a more secure and, and smaller image for sure. But everything else that's kind of in here is just, I call this bash script and duct tape, right? Just like all modern CI, modern CD is all bash script and duct tape uh, strapped together. Right, we can't get rid of this line, but everything else in here is, uh, you know, tacked on. And when we talk about these Docker files, I, I I always think that they just do too much, right? They do that build my stuff step, uh, build my stuff step. They provision the entire environment, right? So thankfully with Go we can run from that scratch image, but you know I have to provision my my environment, which is you know there's tools that are built purposely for that like ansible right install my packages for my os install image magic install libzip uh, it's you're doing those multiple things and then at the end you always have to start my service right so this is a job of systemd or some other init system and your docker file is doing all of these things and it's not really doing any of them well right the unix philosophy of do one thing well is to do one thing well and so this is this is kind of the problem when we look at Docker files and when you're analyzing these and figuring out what goes into them. You know, when you run those arbitrary run commands like apt install uh, libzip or something, you know, that is all very hard to, to attest and track to as it's going into your container. So without complaining, right? What else is there? Uh, well, if you're a Go developer, you may have heard of Co. K O. Uh, it's a tool that can build a Docker container using a uh, 
it, no Docker daemon. It builds the layers of the Docker um, image for you. Knows how to compile that. I think all, all it requires is a Go tool chain under the hood that it calls out to. And, and this will just be able to build you cross, uh, cross architecture containers. And you pretty much just run co-build and you get a container without Docker. So super great if you're a Go developer. Uh, not so great if you're you're using a different language. Jib is kind of similar to Co. It's the, the same thing with Java. You still have to have that Java compiler, but you can still build that container. Uh, but these are purpose-built tools for each language. And so every ecosystem or every language could build a tool like this. Uh, but then you have all this fragmentation and different opinions. And you know, when you're doing tools, you can be opinionated. But this is a lot to learn if you're you're a polyglot programmer, or, you know, making uh, policy decisions for how you build things across your org. Bazel is another great one for for cross-platform. This is based on Google's build internal tool called Bit, uh, Blaze. Uh, people have lots of mixed opinions on Bazel. It it builds Docker files. I mean, builds Docker containers declaratively mostly by being able to build everything itself, build your Python compiler, build your, your GCC compiler using Bootstrap. And uh, it's it's a tool that is kind of difficult for orgs to get uh, started with, and you kind of need to be an expert to, to learn and maintain it. So uh, Bazel definitely uh, gets a lot of people uh, to groan or upset when you suggest it or want to use it. You may have heard of DistroList before if you're in the container world. Uh, a distrolist image contains only your application and its runtime dependencies. They do not contain package managers, shells, or any other programs you would expect to find in a standard Linux distribution. So distrolist was a started a project started from the Google Containers team. Uh, it was an idea of how do we pull all those things out of a container that we don't need, like a package manager. Uh, it is based on Debian. Uh, and it's, it was a great start. Uh, it kind of started as like a 5% project at Google and then uh, Kubernetes said they were going to switch to it, and uh, the people working on it were like, oh, we should probably put some more effort into DistroList. So it was a great start and pioneer in this, this area. Uh, summation of DistroList is you don't need a Linux distribution in your container. If you're running a container, you are using the, the host's uh, kernel. So the container runtime will share in that, that host kernel. So you don't need a kernel. You don't, you don't need a Linux distro for your container. You only need what's required to run your stuff. Uh, in the event of like a, a Go binary or a Rust binary, you typically don't need anything if it's all statically built. Uh, but if you're running Python, you need your Python interpreter, or you need your Node interpreter. So, and so that brings us to Wolfie. So, kind of that's the history and background of why we built Wolfie. Uh, and so, Wolfie is what we call Distrolist v2. Uh, the people who built Distrolist at Google kind of all left and started ChainGuard. So, uh, this was the continuation of that work and. Uh, what they think is done the right way from the start. So we refer to this as distrolist v2. It's an undistro, which kind of just means it doesn't have a kernel yet. Uh, there's, you know, the, we'd like to add a kernel one day to be able to run this in more secure systems, uh, like uh, like real-time operating systems and 5G and IoT stuff. But as of today, there's no kernel, so we call it an undistro. Uh, and when you think about really what is a, a Linux distribution, is it much more than a package manager? Uh, maybe some decisions made. So that's a philosophical one we can have later. Wolfie has a rolling release. So we are continuously building and shipping latest versions of packages, uh, all upstream supported stuff. So Go 119, Go 120. When Go 119 falls out of support, it would be pulled out of Wolfie. So that's the idea is that as things are, are released, we'll keep stable versions around and supported versions around. Uh, there's no version of Wolfie. It uses the Alpine Linux package format, so APKs. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons for this, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, it ships SBOMs for all of the packages, so software bills of material. This kind of has all the bits that went into that package, some of the hidden files that are around. We call that dark matter. So it has some of the, the files. We keep like a receipt of everything that goes into a package, so you can easily find and, and look at this. Uh, and Wolfie is declaratively and re reproducibly built with some tools that we'll take a look at later. And it also supports uh, AMD64 and uh, ARM64 right now. So uh, two flavors of Wolfie for your, your architecture. So why APK? Well, APK is declarative and reproducible. Uh, we declare the package format, and it goes and builds the package and zips it up. And 
um, kind of when you're building an APK package, you get a directory that starts as the root directory and anything you put in there kind of just gets squashed at fast. So you start with your folder and add in a user folder and a bin folder and all that gets extracted to root. So pretty straightforward. Uh, APK will not leave the system in a broken state. So APK has this concept of uh, the world. So if you look in your uh, slash Etsy slash wor uh, APK slash world file, it's kind of just a list of dependencies. And then the when you go to add a file, it adds it to the, the world file and then it runs a resolver. So we'll be able to check if uh, anything cannot be installed before it actually goes and starts it. Uh, and this means that there's no rollbacks. So if you've ever had to do like a, a Debian upgrade and you've got a broken package in the middle, like maybe a permission on a file was wonked up or something, uh, the rollback for that is just kind of, it just leaves the system in this broken state. So APK has no rollbacks because it will resolve first before it does anything. So this is perfect for automated pipelines. Uh, we have a Wolfie SDK uh, uh, image that you can use and look at. Uh, I have a link to these slides at the end too. But this is kind of what you would run to get all the tools to work on Wolfie. And then I have uh, an image scanner. So uh, here at ChainGuard, we, uh, Wolfie is an open source project with open governance. And you know we, we're hoping to grow the community a lot more than we currently have. Uh, but the uh, at ChainGuard, one of the products we offer is we take Wolfie packages and we build container images out of them. So these images are free and open source for folks to use. And I'm just going to run a quick... Uh, gripe scan. This is a container scanner tool. You can use a tool like Sneak or Trivi. Um, they're all going to do the same thing. They're going to take that container image and they're going to look at, at all the packages and kind of find any known vulnerabilities or CVEs in it. So running this, I'm going to pull down that Python image, which I think is about a gigabyte in size. It might take a second. Then it's going to go through, scan all the packages, and then spit out the results. So I have found 638 vulnerabilities. And this is just the, the regular Docker Hub upstream library image. So if you run Docker run Python, this is the image you would get. So there are 678 vulnerabilities, one critical, 47 high, 464 negligible. And then looking through the list here, we see here's a Git vulnerability that's labeled as won't fix. Uh, and this kind of blew my mind when I first looked at it. Like, what is a high vulnerability that won't be fixed? Uh, this has to do with the how Debian does backports, and uh, Debian won't pull from upstream. They'll actually uh, cherry pick patches onto their branch for building Debian packages, which has its pros and cons. But you wind up with uh, this is all noise to me, right? I don't. I have to sit here and vet all these different versions and all these different CVEs and. It's org organizations have told us that they they get mad at the results of these container images that the scanners and they, they kind of just stop running them. So this this helps nobody. And so if we compare that to uh, one of the images that we've built with Wolfie, so this is our Python image, much smaller and has no known vulnerabilities in here. And so we rebuild these images every day. They're free and open source for you to use on GitHub. So I have some links to that at the end, but you can start using these today. Uh, the important thing that I like to call out, other than the the, the, uh, the vulnerabilities, like, sure, that's a cool, big, flashy number, but there's only 45 packages in the image that we built. And these are include, like, Python packages and system packages. If you compare that to the upstream one that has that entire Linux distribution in there, there's 435 packages. So it is a pretty significant difference. And what you wind up with is, is just a bigger surface area for, for vector of attack and issues and all that stuff. So I, I like to you know point out the vulnerability thing, but just having a small container that only has what you need to run your Python application in there is, is super great. So that's scanning those images. Uh, here's those commands that you can run. Known image will be the same. I think the known image has a lot more vulnerabilities in it. Quick graph of what that looks like when compared. You know, all of the images that we build for out of, of Wolfie for our chain guard images are a lot smaller and have significantly less dependencies, which is the best part. Um, if we look at the size of those containers too, you can see that the, the upstream Python image is a gigabyte in size. And then our Python image is 458 megabytes. And that just is 
has to do with the size of Python when it's compiled. Same thing with Node. Our Node image is 109 megabytes, and the upstream one is a gigabyte. And you know, there there are ways to uh, pull smaller images from Docker Hub. You can like pull like Node Slim or Node Alpine, but they all kind of have the same problem. It's just it's a little exaggerated here. So looking at what Wolfie is, if you ever wind up on this Wolfie repo, so it's the GitHub org is just wolfie-dev and slash OS. So this is Wolfie. Uh, you, what you come to find are kind of just a bunch of YAML files and folders. Uh, these are all the packages that actually make up Wolfie. So again, what is a Linux distribution other than a package manager and packages and repository to pull from? So you could see we have repackaged all these things from source into Wolfie. So we rebuild all these images. There's actually, I mean, all these packages. There's actually a huge bootstrap process that we wrote about in our blog that's really cool. Because when you go to uh, bootstrap something like a, a GCC compiler, well, you can't compile a C compiler without a, a compiler. So you have to bootstrap an old one that's untrusted. So download one that's built already, and then use that to build yours, and then use kind of go down this chain where version one can build version two, but version two can't build four, only three can. So then you have to build three. And it's a real interesting problem to solve that we wrote about on the blog, but taking a look at some of these, right? Like here's the Python uh, package for 3.11. Uh, I'll explain more about what this package format is, but you can see here that we're just downloading Python from upstream and then kind of compiling it and building it ourselves. So all of this is declarative and it's all reproducible. So that's what Wolfie looks like in, in a repository form. Again, it's just kind of YAML files for packages. Uh, and then we take all of those packages and we build the ChainGuard images that I was talking about. So this is the ChainGuard images repo. Uh, all of these images here are free for you to use for open source and uh, other use. Uh, we limit them to kind of pulling by the, the latest tag. So if you need something like uh, you know Python 2.7, uh, we offer a, a catalog that you can, you can have a subscription to to pull those. But, uh, our, our main focus is providing current supported upstream uh, versions for free to developers. So, you know, we build versions for Python, Go, Nginx. We have, you know, I call these like appliance images. So definitely take a look at these. These are the ones that we built using Wolfie. And the cool thing is that all of these are uh, the configs and how we build them is all public and open source. And the GitHub Actions pipeline, you can go back and kind of check any sort of build to build any sort of image and it's all attestable and it's all done with SBOMs and signatures. So if we look at what that Python file looks like for building Python 3.11, you know, all it has is really the package that's in that image and then the command to run and then a bunch of user information. So yeah, we'll talk more about this file format in a second, but this is our, our declarative and reproducible pipeline. So using these, these images built with Wolfie is a drop-in replacement for pretty much all of your, your applications. We have examples in most of the repos there. Uh, you can see here that I've been able to uh, cut out some of that, that SSL certs by using this static image. Uh, static just kind of has SSL certs in there and then a few other bits like the time zone database and really just kind of what you need to run a statically compiled binary. We take a look at that config, right? It has time zone data, and that's pretty much it. And then this will also pull in the CA cert bundle. So, and then, yeah, so drop and replacement, easy to get started with, significantly cut down on your image size. And so now I just kind of want to show you a comparison of, of what this looks like to build. Uh, I have a repo that you can grab all this in at the end. Uh, but if we look at uh, a, like a regular Docker file for building a Python app, right? I have a very simple Flask application here which is just you know, importing Flask, it's setting up a Hello World listener in port 80, right? So if we look at what the Docker file looks like for that, we start from Python 3.11, copy in our requirements text, do our dependency install, copy in our main, expose port 80, start up the application, right? So building this, we get a Docker build. This is gonna go out, download those dependencies, run through it all do that pip install, kind of putting in a bunch of untracked files. We don't know what we don't know what all these individual Python files are. And so then I can run that. Let's see. 
So if we run that, it should work. Let's just make sure. Yeah, we got our hello world. Very cool. Ooh, excuse me. Uh, and then, so that's that's the Docker build. And if we look at how big that is, it is a gigabyte, right? So starting from that base Python image and then adding on our dependencies and source file. And so we wind up with this pretty big image to be running. And that's obviously a bunch of resources to be taking up. So moving from the Docker image, we can do that drop and replacement for Wolfie. So this one is a, a bit of a less of a drop in and more of a you have to know how Python loads dependencies. Uh, and this is just kind of the nature as running as rootless. Uh, all of our images by default will run as rootless. Uh, one of the things I meant to show you up here is in our Docker build, uh, pip is actually yelling at us because we're doing a pip install dependencies as root. Uh, and so this, it even warns you here, this can leave the system in a broken state and uh, you should use virtual env or other stuff, right? So, so all of our images that we've built run as rootless by default. Uh, same kind of looking thing. This is using a multi uh, build step. Uh, so we start off with our, our dev variant. So we have the latest and latest dev. Dev usually has a shell and some other stuff in there. And then we have our our install dependencies. We have our copy dependencies. You kind of have to know where those dependencies go, which is our non-root user and copy those over and same kind of deal. So let's build that. And we're gonna see that this is a lot smaller. And what do we wind up with? Yeah, 56 megabytes versus a gigabyte. So significant, dramatically smaller image because it has Python and it has my code in it. Um, so that's Wolfie and that's ChainGuard images in a nutshell. Uh, I have a few minutes left. I'll quickly show you kind of the power user mode that we talked through and how we build Wolfie. Uh, we have two tools that we've built called APK on Melange. Uh, these are also open source and free to use though. Uh, we don't recommend most people jump into using these right there. It's again, this is like the power user mode. Uh, APK is a, a, an APKO is an APK based OCI image builder. It's fully reproducible by default. It's a testable, so everything that runs and, and gets installed to APK, we generate S bombs for, and you have full attestations for everything. There's no run statements. All APK does is take a list of packages and install them into a container, which you wind up with those super small images. It builds images super fast. Uh, this is what an APK O file looks like. Uh, this is what I was showing you before. Uh, we have our CA cert bundle for my Python image here, my Go image, and then I have my other my code package, which I add, and then set some other stuff. Uh, Melange is how we build a APK package from your code or from uh, upstream code. Uh, it does multi-arch builds by default, generates signatures and SBOMs, and it, uh, it has signing keys. Uh, this is what I was showing as well. So this kind of has a package. Uh, the, the build dependencies of that package and the pipeline to go through. So you can see here that this is the build my stuff command. So I've taken that out of my Docker file, put it into a single thing that does one thing well, which is build my code into a package. So if we run that real quick, we'll see what it looks like. So if I do a melange build, so this is gonna go, it's going to build my Python app into a, uh, a package. So it's basically zipping it up with all those bits in there that it needs. Install, it does my pip install, but it actually has generated SBOMs for all of those pip dependencies. So it has a receipt for every file that has gone into this package. So I know what exists, right? And showing you what that looks like, apko.yaml, same kind of deal, build my Python application, copy my dependencies over. And if we look at what those SBOMs look like, uh, it's in a smaller directory. And so I can take that that APKO, I mean, that Melange package, and now I can turn that into a image. And so this is building a Python image and it, it kind of flies by in the blink of an eye. And all this does is, is it takes a list of packages and installs them into a container image. So you can see here, there's the list of dependencies uh, and somewhere in here, it has my Python app as a dependency. So I can load that up with Docker. You'll see it's 27 megabytes, super small. And we can run it the same way. 
and it should just work. And it does, right? And so we wound up with a smaller, more secure image. Uh, and again, we don't recommend or, or tell you to use these tools. You, you can if you want to. They still have a bit of usability and work to be done, but they were built to solve the problem of how we build containers. Uh, some other resources that you can take a look at as I'm running out of time. Uh, we have our, our Wolfie community. Wolfie is an open source project that anyone can use. So we're trying to grow the governance there. Uh, we have an education site that you can use to learn more about Wolfie and images in general. And then there's a link to that repository. Uh, and then here's a link to the slides. If you want to grab them, you can scan the QR code or grab that bit.ly link. But uh, that's all I have time for. And thank you all so much for joining and having me.